afternoon, and welcome to today's Read Aloud. Ruth Sesco had a family emergency, so she's not here to introduce today. Um, but I'm going to introduce Joe Marino, who is one of our library staff people. And you're in, what, what is it called now? Serials ordering? Well, now we're called <laughs> Acquisitions Continuation. Yes, yeah, so he orders our serials and things that, that, you know, databases and things like that. Um, but one thing that's always interesting to me, and we're having worked in libraries for a long time now, is that there's always people working for us who have these extensive scholarly interests outside the library, to the extent that I really feel like it's probably the library work that is the side option for them, and this other thing is the main, main interest, so that may or may not be true of Joe, I'll let him tell you. But he's going to talk about and read from his book, Wrapped Up in the Shroud, which is about his uh, involvement in researching the Shroud of Turin. So, Thank you for coming. Um, this is uh, nonfiction, but um, some of it might sound a little so crazy you might question that, but we'll see. I'll start with the preface. I'll give you a little bit of a background. Most people know that a Trekkie is a person who is a fan of the Star Trek TV movie series. Fewer people probably know that a Shroudy, inspired by the term Trekkie, is a person who is passionately involved in the study of the Shroud of Turin, the reputed burial cloth of Jesus that contains the mysterious front and back images of a crucified man. The study of the Shroud actually has a technical name, syndonology, from the Greek word syndon, the, uh, the fine cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus. The Shroud is one of the most intensely studied artifacts in human history. Hundreds of thousands of hours have been spent studying the cloth, and although some people, mostly skeptics, have claimed to have solved the mystery, nothing could be further from the truth. It is still a mystery with a capital M, and it's vastly more important than the face of Jesus on the doggy door and tea towel and similar stories that surface from time to time in the news. I have been a shroudy, or to use the more technical and more reverent sounding term, a syndonologist, for more than half of my life, almost 34 years of my 56 years at the time of this writing. To say that the Shroud of Turin has been a big part of my life would be a gross understatement. It played a part in my joining a monastery, in my leaving that monastery, and in my marriage to someone whose life was also greatly affected by the Shroud. The title and subtitle of this book are a double pun, being both about Jesus having literally been wrapped up in a shroud after his passion and death, and about me having a passion about the shroud and being wrapped up in it metaphorically. I have collected several hundred books on the shroud, not to mention thousands of articles, letters, emails, videos, and newsletters. I probably have one of the 10 best English language personal shroud collections in the world. None of the previously published Shroud books focus on how the cloth affected the major events and the day-to-day -day life of the author like the book you hold in your hand does. Most Shroud books concentrate on the scientific, historical, and theological aspects of the cloth. Those aspects will be touched upon here, but will not be the main focus per se. I never really had a strong desire to write a book about the Shroud. I found writing papers for periodicals and conferences tough enough. But when I called a friend of mine to encourage her to take part in the questionnaire for Shroudies, she in turn encouraged me to write a book about my incredible experiences over the years with the Shroud. With dozens of Shroud websites, blogs, and already hundreds of books on the subject already out there, I wondered if another Shroud book was really needed. But as I had enjoyed in the questionnaire reflecting about my experiences, and as other people also encouraged me to write a book, I decided to take a stab at it. If you are reading this, I managed to complete it. The clincher was when one person said that it would be a good way to honor my late wife, Emma Sue Benford, with whom I collaborated on some very significant shroud work. Sue, the name she went by, did not get involved in the shroud, in shroud work until 1997, but from that time until, until her untimely death in 2009, she made enormous contributions. In 2002, her autobiography, Strong Woman, Unshrouding the Secrets of the Soul, was published. It was republished in 2011. The back cover of her book reads, When Susie Benford was a child, she almost died from cancer. However, she survived, but with multiple handicaps. 
Thwarted by both physical and emotional challenges, an inner strength propels her to a miraculous physical achievement when she becomes the strongest woman in the world, three-time world powerlifting champion, holder of all the world records in the 97-pound weight class. Currently, Benford is a registered nurse, healthcare researcher, and executive director of a nonprofit biomedical organization in Ohio. Her education is diverse from the in-depth study of religion to pursuing scientific testing of unexplained paranormal phenomena, i.e. the Shroud of Turin and spontaneous human combustion. Benford's experiences with psychic phenomena are responsible for the redirection of her life into the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. In 1997, she contacted Father Joseph Marino, a Benedictine monk and Catholic priest at St. Louis Abbey. Their divinely inspired meeting and subsequent joining as life partners served a research liaison that is credit, credited with uncovering vital information leading to the authentic, authentication of the Shroud. Strong Woman is a real life transformation story full of hope, strength, encouragement, and inspiration that culminates in the understanding that there is much more to our existence than meets the eye. Susie's story is also your story. One of the parallel forces of strength development, physical, emotion, emotional, and spiritual. It is the story of who we truly are, our spiritual heritage and our divine destiny. Her back cover blurb includes the word paranormal. I know that many Christians have a negative reaction when they see this word. Take, for example, the term spontaneous human combustion. Sue believed it to be just a rare medical condition. When she was interviewed about it for a television documentary, the footage of her explaining that it was no more than a rare medical condition was left on the cutting room floor. After all, if it's just a medical condition and not an enduring mystery, there will be no more opportunities in the future for lucrative documentaries. <laughs> Due to such agendas, beware of most Shroud documentaries. The word paranormal did spark, as the English would say, a row, between some Shroud conference organizers and me, along with Sue, which is described in some detail in one of the chapters. Although this is not a scholarly work as such, I believe there is much here to satisfy serious Shroud researchers. Letters and emails that I have reproduced, both in the main body when they are pertinent to the main focus of the chapter, and also in the appendices, will provide the serious Shroud scholar with some fascinating, fascinating new information. Very few people have ever seen these communications. I have also included some previously unpublished material that is extremely significant from an historical point of view. These include the handwritten notes of a scientist at an important C-14 meeting, C-14 being carbon-14 dating, as well as personal correspondence with the most well-known shroud skeptic. I have not cluttered the text with footnotes, but there are extensive references which give ample scholarly citation to books, articles, websites, and conference presentations. Many readers might ask, is the Shroud really that important? Considering the amount of time that has been spent studying it, one must acknowledge that at least on one level, the answer is an unqualified yes. Undoubtedly, the Shroud speaks deeply to people, many of whom, including myself, have spent decades researching this cloth. A Harper's Magazine article from 1981 relates the fact that one Italian researcher obtained shroud samples from another researcher at gunpoint. From a theological point of view, however, the strict answer would be no. Christianity neither stands nor falls on the authenticity of the shroud. Yet it can be for many people, as it was for me, a trigger of faith. The empty tomb of Jesus was not proof of his resurrection, and neither is the shroud. However, the empty tomb, in conjunction with the words and deeds of Jesus, and the witness of men and women who claim they saw him after he died, has convinced billions of people that Jesus was the Son of God. Similarly, the image shroud, in conjunction with <coughs> scientific evidence and people's personal experiences, has convinced many that this cloth was actually in the tomb of the historical Jesus, and for some, is even an indication of his resurrection. 
When I gave Shroud lectures, many people would come up to me afterward and tell me they wanted to learn more about it. I always gave them a friendly warning. Be careful. If you get into studying the Shroud, you may never be able to get out of it. The Shroud has a way of penetrating and staying with a person once exposed to it. I have known only a few people who have been deeply into it and didn't end up making it a lifelong commitment. In my own life, it has been an enormous catalyst that has taken me to Israel, France, and Italy, and has educated me in many disciplines of study, into, into which I would uh, have otherwise never have bothered to delve. <clears throat> Some of my own experiences described here will read like fiction, but I assure you they are all true. I'm just not creative enough to be able to make up all of what I'll relate. Science will have a hard time coming up with a rational explanation for some of the events I will describe. There was an inner voice which gave me a strange command, which led me to participate in an on-air radio debate about the shroud. There was a lost shroud booklet that I definitely heard, but did not actually see, apparently reappear out of the world. If you want real fiction, just read on the internet or in books some of the explanations that skeptics offer for the resolution of the many mysteries of the shroud. Many skeptics who have done little or no study of the shroud make confident assertions about it being forgery. Rarely, if ever, have I seen such skeptics state that they would have to spend more time on it. Qualified to offer an opinion. I have always felt that one of my missions in life was to spread information about the Shroud. A book is a good way to do that, but why does it have to be so much a labor? Fortunately, a labor of love feels more like love than labor. It is my hope that this book will be both entertaining and educational. Around the time I was writing this, I happened to come across the following noteworthy entry in an internet blog. Quote, after working 16 hours a day for 45 years, Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz has finished translating the Babylonian Talmud from archaic Aramaic, Aramaic into contemporary Hebrew. Whenever I think of the effort I put into writing this book, I'm going to think of that. Even if only one person is affected by reading this, perhaps by inspiring that person to seriously research the shroud, 